And I now like to welcome our expert dialogue session with lots of people who you've heard their names coming up quite a lot today, actually. So Matt Delph is the director of the Office of Wellbeing Strategy at the University of British Columbia, based in Vancouver, and also chair of the Canadian Health Promoting Campuses Network. We also have Monica Suarez Reyes, is an assistant professor in the School of Physical Activity, Sports, and Health Sciences at the Universidad de Santiago de Chile, based in Santiago, Chile. We also have Mark Doris, who's a professor in health and sustainability and co-director of the Healthy and Sustainable Settings Unit at Institute of Citizenship, Society and Change at the University of Central Lancashire, and also chair of the UK Healthy Universities Network. Hey, Mark. Uh, you can find links to their bios on our website, and welcome, Matt, Monica, and Mark. Thank you, Julia, and I'll kick things off. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to say how energized I am by the conversation today. This has been incredible to see the uh, diversity of perspectives and engagement from all corners of the world. So um, yeah, really looking forward to kicking off this conversation with my colleagues, Monica and Mark. Um, so we are going to shift into about 20 minutes of conversation, reflecting on some of the work and research that's happening in the health promoting universities and colleges movement. And I'm going to kick things off by posing a question to my colleagues for us all to chat about briefly. So Mark and Monica, the UK, the, in Iberia, America and in Canada, we've been engaged in the health promoting movement for a decade and more. Um, what factors have stood out to you that aid in effective implementation and either past or emerging? Go ahead. Okay. Look ready to jump in, Monica. I can go first. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here for the invitation. Um, yes, um, I work in Chile. Chile is part of the Ibero American network of health promoting universities. And um, a couple of years ago, we conducted a, stu a study. Um, a qualitative study to explore the main factors that influence the implementation of this initiative in different universities in different countries in Ibero-America. So I have uh, heard from all the other talks, what are the factors, but in this study, we identified the most important ones, identified by the, by the, the key um, persons in different, universities and we identify that the most important factor to implement successfully a health promoting university initiative is to have the political support so by having the political support of the university um, in some way you can ensure the sustainability of the um, of the initiative however some universities have implemented the, um, the initiative without this support. So in the meantime, they obtain the support. They have to demonstrate that the help promoting university initiative is, is important, have results, is well received by students, professors, and all the university community. Some other uh, factors that are important to implement a health promoting university based on the results of this study in Ibero America is to have a coordination staff of, in, in the university. So some of the um, initiative um, starts based on the um, um, the idea from a few people in the university, so as some, someone said before, we need more. We need to collaborate inside university and also outside university. Resources as uh, the previous, uh, um, I know Akua says, funding and resources are very important too and also participation of students. So these are the five most important uh, factors that have been uh, identified by key um, person in different universities. Political support in the first place, uh, holding coordination, collaboration, resources, and participation of all members of the university. 
Mark. Great, thank you. Um, when I was reflecting on this question, I, I, I've, I've thought about it at a network level and within individual higher education institutions. So at a network level, I, I'd also, first of all, identify resources um, to get the UK network properly established with a strong membership and website and infrastructure it was really influential to, to secure resources, even though at the moment we, we, we don't have any and we haven't really had very many for years, but it got us going. Um, second, alongside that, I think the passion and energy of key individuals able to take on leadership roles was crucial in sustaining and continuing to build that network in the absence of um, very much external funding. I think third, it's been important to consciously combine a focus on practical action and guidance with at the same time almost like daring to, to, to retain a, a broad vision of, of what health promoting universities is about that connects health with other key agendas, for example, planetary well-being, inclusion, social and ecological justice. And, and fourth, I think it's also been important to agree key approaches and ways of working. Uh, and for example, a, a lot of our networks, I'd highlight three factors. I think first, I'd again point to the import, importance of identifying leaders with passion, energy and leverage, able to advocate for health, well-being and sustainability as priorities and strategic drivers. Um, and I'd also emphasise there that while it's vital to have leadership from the top, it's also important that that leadership is distributed throughout the organisation and that point's been raised by a number of presenters I think during the day. I think second we need to we need to build resilience um, acknowledging that that there will be ups and downs so uh, our initiative at University of Central Lancashire is, is 27 years since we were established um, and sometimes it feels like we've taken three steps forward and then two back you know it's not a it's not just steady progress it can be influenced by all sorts of things. And, and finally, I think it's helpful to use the momentum provided by developments in the sector. For example, the accelerated concern about student mental health problems and sort of crisis that there's certainly been in the UK and I know Canada and other countries too, while not getting subsumed by those. And by that, that I mean, I think we need to continue to assert the holistic thinking that underpins the healthy campus approach whilst engaging with those key kind of drip, drip, issues that are, that are coming to the fore. You've both covered a lot of gra important ground um, and, and echoed a lot of what was said today. I'll just maybe highlight a couple of other additional points. Um, Canada has actually, you know, also been lucky in that the, we've been working within a health promotion frame for a long time. And I'm lucky to actually have the Ottawa Charter created in Canada and now the Okanagan Charter created in Canada. Um, and then in 2016, we formed the Canadian Network for Health Promoting Campuses. Um, and I would say the Okanagan Charter really accelerated things because it gave us a, a plain language guide framework to um, organize the work and to create a formal adoption structure. So that's worked very well in Canada and that we have um, presidents have to sign off and say we formally adopt the charter and commit to do some things to drive it into action. And as of last week, we have 35 institutions that have formally adopted, as well as a number of endorsing organizations. And I think for building the capacity and resources, resources you're talking Mark, it's important to have these other organizations like the Canadian Mental Health Association or our student associations or our athletics and recreation Mental groups. They all provide an, a lot of important capacity to support um, campuses. Um, the other thing I've noticed is a helpful shift from a pathogenic to more salutogenic focus. So instead of focusing on just on students' health needs or sub you know, uh, substance, substance abuse, abuse concerns, it's been really about how do we think of those settings where we learn, work, play, live, um, and look at things like how we design our buildings and how we teach and do learning, conduct learning in the classroom with the well-being framework and how we support our employees to be productive and well. Um, and how we design our, you know, as we heard from the presidents and chancellors, make this just an ethos fundamentally to everything that we do. And it's been exciting to see that shift happen 
in the last few years. Um, and then finally, and we can talk about this more maybe later, but yeah, connecting across these many emerging social, social agendas, I think at least at UBC and the colleagues that I'm talking to, that's what we are working on now is thinking about how we can um, work more closely and across these intersections of equity and sustainability and indigeneity. Yeah. Okay. I have a second question. And um, for me, this is one of the most difficult ones. So the question is that there has been some really good work developing conceptual frameworks focus on uh, whole university, whole system approaches. Um, what would you advise uh, be for people wanting to translate this theory into practice. Matt? Oh, sure. I was nodding along because it's actually the question <laughs> I hear the most. <laughs> and then I'd love to hear Mark's um, thoughts on this too. But yeah, I, the question of how do we translate the theory or the Okanagan Charter and its principles into practice is something we talk about a lot on campus. So I can maybe just share the UBC <laughs> experience. Um, you know, for us, it was creating a, um, embedding it into the university strategic plan and then creating our own, what we call our well-being strategic framework, which is UBC's vision of how we enact the Okanagan Charter. And we take the principles and the calls to action and we bolt that into our own university adapted plan. And then after many years of engagement with the community and much of that was student led, identify the priorities where we think as an institution, we wanna focus our time. So it looks like we've lost Mark for a minute, but I hope we'll get him back. Um, so yeah, we launched something called uh, Conversations and Wellbeing in the early years and had some wonderful programs that connected with the community to say, what should we focus on? And so those are a bit more topic focused issues like mental health resilience or um, food nutrition. But the other thing I wanted to highlight is we've really had a strong focus on the notion of collaborative leadership. And that's one of our priorities because it's not just the outcomes that are important, it's how we do this work and how we build capacity um, to work across the silos um, and to engage our students and researchers and administration. And in UBC's case, we're actually at the scale of a small city. We have another 30, 40,000 people that live on the university land. So the community at large is really important as well. So, you know, it's things like having round faculty roundtables, it's having committees for our different areas that have all community members represented. Um, and any initiative that we do focuses on engaging the community and putting the, the principles of the charter and a whole systems approach in the terms of reference of every single initiative. So that's how we kind of try to bring it to life. Mark, it looks like you're back on. We lost you for a minute there. Yeah, so sorry about that? sorry about that. My my connection dropped out, but fortunately reconnected almost instantly. So apologies if I repeat something you said. Um, I think, I mean, it's a question I get asked very often, and I guess that's because quite a lot of the conceptual frameworks I've had something to do with, with um, with initiating or, or writing or, or thinking through. Um, and I guess the first thing I'd say is that I think into practice that, that there's something about finding the things that resonate with you. And, and, and certainly when I and colleagues have been trying to, to kind of write up and, and depict those, those, that conceptual thinking, we've often used kind of visual representations, um, which hopefully kind of are easier to, to think what might this mean in practice I think the second thing is around um, uh, it, it, it is around the the combination of of holding on but actually finding real world entry points um, and 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 accepting that there might be kind of incremental steps to take on that journey um, and then the third thing I think is is that actually that, that the language of whole system, university, whole sector, whole community sometimes gets conflated into one thing. And I think it can sometimes be helpful to think about the different elements. So, so actually, you know, a whole a whole campus, whole university, whole institution approach is looking at how do you join up the parts within your institution and, and harness those 
so that everybody and everything is is part of the whole and you understand those links but at the same time universities don't exist in isolation from the rest of society so um, actually what we're doing in one in one university often is influenced by what's happening in the wider higher educational post tertiary sector so i think there's that whole sector approach but also uh, within our wider localities so for me in the city of Preston for Matt in Vancouver um, and actually recognizing that we're one of a number of settings um, and, and it's it's about how how do we link in with those other other settings organizations this is that are in place um, and and I guess the final thing I'd say is is picking up what Julia said in the introduction to, to this final se session, where she talked about being willing to try things out, make mistakes and learn from those and share that learning. So I think in translating theory into practice, that's a key thing is being prepared to try things out and work out. And sometimes it won't work, um, but we just need to, 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 to be humble about that and honest about it and accept that that's part of our journey. Your thoughts, Monica. Monica, do you have it? Yeah, I I just want to add that most universities or all universities have already in place different actions to improve health, well-being, and so on. So sometimes it's not necessary to create from zero new things, strategies, and, and others. So sometimes. What is necessary is to change the way that we look at these uh, actions. For example, I don't know, is to change that, to treat problems of um, mental health at the university, to change that focus into how to prevent, how to promote healthy environments, to avoid the to problems in the future. So some university or most university have a healthcare system in a university to treat their problems related to mental health, but how we can change the idea to promote a good health, how to change the idea to promote a rela healthy relationships and so on. So it's not just about creating new things, but to see the things from another point of view, adopting the the, the kind of charter or, or the whole system approach. So I'm sure that most universities um, care about you know, uh, students, professors and whole community. So we need to, to think uh, how, to, how to adopt this this whole system approach. Totally agree, Monica, and it's hard to do, I find. So I raise, try to raise that point in almost every meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so I have, a, I have a third question and we'll have to keep, try and keep our, our answers concise for this, I think, so we don't run over. Um, clear, clearly, we, we're part of a global movement. And I, I, I can't remember how many countries are represented here today, but I know it's a substantial number. And that's even accepting the, the, the challenges of time zones. Um, so we're part of, a glo of that global movement for health promoting universities and colleges. And I'm just interested in, in views about how can we strengthen or build on and strengthen that collaboration across countries and, and actually really develop that global movement and what are the barriers and the opportunities? Who wants to go first? Monica? Um, well, I can say that one of the main barriers that I identified is the language. As, um, so we, for me, it's necessary to combine. Um, in Iberoamerica, there exists a huge movement of health promoting university. But at some um, at some point, for me, um, this movement functioned separately from other uh, 
movement day in UK or Canada or New Zealand, Australia. So for from this part of the world, <laughs> we all have in common the, the same language, Spanish, but sometimes this is the, it's a barrier to, to, to work um, together with the, the other networks. Um, at the same time, this kind of, um, of opportunities like this symposium, well, um, Congress and so on, are the opportunity to, to, to meet other people, to work with other people, to know how other networks are uh, working on different topics. So for me, this the language, one of the main barriers and the opportunity is this kind of activities that we all can connect even um, when we are in different parts physically, we can share thoughts, opinions yeah. about the same topic. Yeah, and actually, let me just build off the language thing to share an exciting announcement that we haven't shared yet, but we will, in the coming days, have official translations of the Okanagan Charter in Spanish, German, and French that we will share out as soon as they're published and ready. Some of them are complete, but they are, they're not on the website to find yet, so I hope that will help. Um, I'll give three really quick ones. Um, one is, I think it's critical we make it part of job descriptions that staff have capacity to have this work both across the university, but with other universities. I'm lucky to have that as one of my priorities. So we need to you know, build in that capacity to do the capacity building work. It's critical. Um, secondly, work with non-obvious partners. In our case, we work very closely with international sustainability campus networks, equity, indigenous, um, uh, there's a number of networks that in, promote Indigenous human rights and reconciliation. And so we can leverage these other groups doing the same kind of system change work with different language, but really we're all trying to get at some of the same fundamental change. Um, and then finally, for those that don't have a network, just use the Okanagan Charter, get some people together, and often that takes care of itself. But the more you can put resources and tools online, I think the more that that helps, like Mark has done. So maybe that's a good segue back to you, Mark. <laughs> Yeah, I think you covered um, most of the things I'd have highlighted as as the barriers and opportunities. Um, I, I, I think funding and resources remains a key challenge for us, actually strongly linked to our ability to overcome language barriers. Um, you know, it, across different languages and, and allow people to communicate more easily is actually expensive and um we we've as a global movement we've got very limited funds if any funds you know it's mainly on goodwill at the moment particular networks so i think we do need to look at that and we need to continue trying to engage with um organizations like the world world health organization um to to, to see how that might help um, And, and and yeah, I, I was really encouraged today by by hearing not just from established networks, but the and the exciting work, but also from from other countries like like presenters from Bulgaria talking about wanting to become part of the university in Turkey here and so on. And I think as you said, Matt, that's that's fantastic. Um, quick close with um, just one very short statement from each of us of what is a highlight that we've heard during the symposium to inform the health writing campuses movement as we look forward so Matt do you want to go first yeah it's hard to pick one but I'll pick one um, I think for me one of the most profound things that we need to all do is is really learn from the knowledge of indigenous peoples which goes back millennia and honor their teachings and think holistically about people and planet the way they have been um, talking about and our keynotes today have been talking about uh, UBC is I think one of the first universities to formally adopt the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and so we are committed to a long journey ahead to do more of that work so that's where I'm leaving with some energy and um, yeah passion. Monica? Yes. Um, if I have to pick one, I will keep with participation. Um, 
participation in all the decisions and participation in the implementation of these different strategies. Um, I think that traditionally um, authorities, professors are used to take or make decisions and just to do it without the, the participation of all in people involved. So that for me, that would be participation, the importance of participation in this, this kind of initiative. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll say the prerogative of having two, even though I've said I'm only allowed to have one. So firstly, I found the, <laughs> the energy, the enthusiasm and the honesty in the president's and vice chancellor's conversation really refreshing. And it was great that, that my colleague Charlotte, who's, who's our health promoting university coordinator at, at UCLan, kept, email, keeps, kept emailing me saying how inspiring it was and all the things it was motivating her to think about and do. 